Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. And I'd like to give a special thank you to the organizers that made all this happen today. So we're going to talk about today um, Design My Contract in Elixir, where the Erlang motto, let it crash, meets it shouldn't crash. And we're going to see how and why. I am Elba Sanchez. Um, I made this conference uh, with this talk with a partner, uh, Guillermo Iwarán. He could not be here, um, so I'm going to give it myself. Um, we both work at a company named Bright. Uh, it is a company that is trying to reinvent how people commute, and we want to, to remove one million cars uh, from the road by helping people share their own vehicles through carpooling. And meanwhile, we help the environment. Uh, here in Wright, we work in a daily basis with Elixir. So starting with design by contract, how did we get here? Bugs and crashes. We deal with them every day. We try to avoid having them. So who has been on the Uber situation? <laughs> Only me? <laughs> OK. Um, what happened to him, maybe he missed an escape, an cache when he was testing. So did you know that there are really expensive software errors? And there are all also um, mortal errors, but we're not getting that dramatic. So like the NASA Mars Climate Orbiter that crashed, it, dis it disintegrated when the spacecraft encountered Mars on a trajectory that brought it too close to the planet. What happened in here? Um, the computer software produced output in the United States customary units instead of Newton seconds uh, in the metric units. So this was all in a contract between NASA and Lockheed, but they missed it. Um, also, the Hedro Terminal 5 open that misplaced more than 23,000 bags uh, canceled 500 flights and may lost of 60 million pounds. Um, what happened here was that when they, was testing, they were testing, they left all the data in the database, and when they were trying uh, to do the real thing, the system could not handle it anymore. Um, also, the Mariners 1 spacecraft that also crashed, um, <laughs> The rocket responded improperly to commands for the guidance systems on the, on the ground. Why? Because they missed the hyphen. That error cost uh, 28.5 million dollars. Also, uh, the Morris worm. It was initially uh, greeted not to cause damage, but to uh, gauge the size of the internet but it ended really, really bad. Um, also, the night, uh, the night error that costed uh, $440 million, uh, the story tells that um, the unmaintained code base, uh, they, uh, it had a bug that uh, they couldn't find because the code w uh, hadn't been used for eight years. And also, the Ariane 5 flight 501, uh, who also crashed. And this is the example that we're going to, to have for this presentation. So in 1996, a uh, half a million software error uh, caused the crash of the maiden flight of the Ariane 5 launcher. Um, the, the rocket was reusing working software pro from its predecessor, the Ariane 4. But its faster engines exploited a bug that was not found in these models. So 36 seconds before, um, after the launch, it crashed. What happened? The software tried to cram a 64-bit number into a 16-bit space. <laughs> so in other words, the value that was converted was greater than what can be represented in a 16-bit sign there. So after this, uh, like there was no explicit exception handler to catch the exception. Uh, so it followed the usual flow of an uncaught exception. Uh, it broke the, so the entire software, and hence the onboard computers and the entire mission. So this is the kind of trivial error that we all are familiar with. 
although the consequences for us are not um, that expensive. So when they did the postmortem about this case, they found that they couldn't uh, blame management because, well, something clearly went wrong, but in this case, that there was not what the issue was technical. Um, they couldn't blame the language either because uh, they use ADA uh, for this, but and the, except, the exception mechanism is not the best. But in this case, not all the conversions were protected. They couldn't blame imp implementation either. Uh, what they did was they removed the conversion protection to achieve performance. Um, that was criticized, but it was backed and justified by a theoretical analysis. And they also couldn't blame testing. Um, but because even if you always can test more, you can never test all. So what they really have to blame was the reuse specification. Uh, what was unacceptable here um, was the absence of any kind of precise specification associated with the reusable model. Uh, so um, the requirement that the horizontal bias uh, should fit in a 16-bit uh, sign integer was in fact a state in an obscure part of the mission document, but it was nowhere to be found in the code itself. So back to design by contract, we're going to start with a little bit of theory and history. So design by contract has its roots in work on formal verification, formal specification, and horse logic. It is a formal system with a set of logical rules uh, for reasoning about correctness of, a com of computer programs. So all the basics uh, that we're going to need for these presentations are the basics of horse logic. Horse de uh, described um, the use of a representation invariant and abstract functions to prove correctness of abstract data types. Uh, we're going to see a little bit more easy this concept right now. So the basics of horse logic. Um, horse logic is at the core of the deductive approach of design by contract. And the central feature of horse logic is the horse triplet. Uh, this triplet describes how the execution of a piece of code changes the state of computation. So this, the whole triplet is formed where P and Q are assertions and C is a command. P is name a precondition and C a, and Q a postcondition. When the precondition is met, executing the command C, uh, it establishes a postcondition. So, uh, horse logic is much more in t uh, extense. It provides actions and, inf and a lot of inference rules. There are rules for concurrency, procedure jumps, and pointers. But we're going to stay just with the basics for this presentation. So, m we may want to, to see design by contract versus testings. Uh, contracts, as in daily life, are a set of specifications that cover mutual obligations, benefits, and consistency constraints that a software system has to meet. Uh, versus testing, a uh, design back contract falls under the implementation and design. And the unit tests, in this case, uh, use, are used to verify that the software works correctly under, simple, uh, under certain example cases. And it it's, with this, it's hard to detect all possible, possible edge cases during development. So what is, in fact, designed by contract? Um, in human affairs, this is an illustrated contract between an airline and a customer. So for me as a passenger uh, to get from Colombia, where I'm from, uh, to here, I had to buy an airline ticket. My obligations as a, as a client were to buy an airline ticket uh, bring acceptable baggage at the airport and be two hours uh, before there. And my rights as a client, I get to reach a destination. Also, the obligations for the airline is to bring the passenger, in this case me, to the destination, and they have the right to not to carry a passenger who is late or that has an acceptable baggage 
or that hasn't paid the ticket. So the obligations as a client must ensure preconditions, and the rights as a client must um, benefit from post conditions. The obligations as a supplier must ensure preconditions, and the rights as a supplier may assume preconditions. <coughs> so the structure of a contract. Uh, we have, I have talked now about preconditions and post conditions. Uh, Precondition is usually a required clause, and a post condition, an insured clause. Uh, this precondition characterizes the, uh, the responsibility of a program um, that calls that method, and the post condition characterizes the responsibility of a program that implements that method. So, if the precondition is true when a method is called, then the method will, termi will terminate returning the, to the calling program and the post condition will be true. And if the precondition is not true, uh, when this method is called, then the, meto the method will do nothing. So here we have uh, an example if in a NIFL version, we are assuming a return call put that inserts a value in a dictionary and this will be retrievable through a key. We can see here the required clause that introduces an input condition or a precondition, and an ensure clause that introduces an output condition or a post condition. Both of these conditions are a sample of assertions or contract clauses in this case, associated with software elements. In the required clause or the precondition, uh, count is the current number of elements and capacity is the maximum number. And in the insure clause or the, po the post condition, has is the Boolean query which tells uh, whether a certain element is present in the dictionary and an item returns the element associated with a certain key. So back to Ariane's case, uh, this is another piece of EFL, of, of EFL code <clears throat> that where we added a required or, or a precondition. Um, here we tell that the horizontal bias should not be greater than the maximum bias. So does it mean that the crash would automatically have been avoided by having the mission use a language um, or, a, or method supporting building assertion in a design by contract? That is a bold thing to say, but maybe. So how can all this theory help? Well, we as developers uh, seek for several things, and one of them is productivity. So this is a really good quote for this. When quality is pursued, productivity follows. We also look for reliability. And there are two points that highlight in reliability. Uh, robustness that Robust software acts acceptably in cases it which cannot do what it's supposed to do. And correctness, correct software does what it's supposed to do, and that's it. So if I want to check my bank account online, I should be able to do it without um, that transaction reducing my balance or incrementing it. It should, be, it should do what is correct, and that's it. <clears throat> Advantages of the side by contract. Um, we have assertions, preconditions, and poor conditions uh, that can be automatically turned on or off during testing. This through a simple compiler option and errors might be cut then. The assertion can remain turned on during execution, triggering an exemption it is if it's violated. And as assertions are prime components of software, uh, we can automatically produce documentation with this, which is pretty cool. There are several language, languages that support, um, that have implementations of design by contract libraries, like JavaScript, Ruby, Java, PHP, and C++. And there are other languages that have native, native support for design by contract, like Eiffel, uh, Clojure, Racket, or Ada. So how can we achieve something like this with Elixir? 
<coughs> with the power of metaprogramming. Here's the book cover of the Metaprogramming Elixir book by Chris McCord, which should be around here. Anyway. Um, um, we are going to take leverage of macros. So the Elixir macros give uh, programmers the power to uh, write code that writes code. It's, it provides the freedom to extend the language. Um, but macros give us great power, and with great power comes great responsibility. So there are a few rules uh, about writing macros. The first rule is don't write macros. So you may hear this, ru this rule uh, loudly when talking to other programmers uh, about metaprogramming. And um, remember that writing code, that write code, uh, requires a special care. Um, because m m uh, with macros, programs can be difficult to debug and reason about. And use this when there is a clear advantage uh, over using it um, over standard functions. And the second rule about macros is use macros like they're free. So this, this, this is kind of not the first rule. Uh, but if we think about it in Fight Club, um, what the, the rule taught us is to break rules. So when we are ready to use macros, we can use them grat gratuitously. So don't be afraid and use, and use to use and learn about the macro system. And macros can be used to save time and, sh and share functionality in a fun and productive way. So as I said before, macros is code that writes code. Uh, many constructs in Elixir are macros, like def, the if, unless, and the def models between others. And the macros allow the domain-specific language abstractions and provides the freedom of, extent, of extending the language, as I said before. Also, the Elixir code runs at compile time and can be used to manipulate the language AST. So use, uh, so use appropriately macros often um, offer effective model composition and code generation techniques. So what, as some of you may know, maybe the majority of you uh, know an, that an, AC, an AST, an abstract syntax tree, uh, is a representation of code on its own data structure. So the building block of an Elixir program is represented with a tuple of three elements where the first element is an atom or another tuple in the same representation. The second element is a keyword list containing metadata, like numbers and context. And the third element it is either a list of arguments for the function, uh, for the function call or an atom. When the element is an atom, it means that the tuple represents a variable. So we have a couple of macros uh, that we use uh, to build the design by contract library for Elixir. Um, the quote macro, which you can get a representation of any expression by using it. So uh, here you see that we do the quote to a function sum with a list of uh, arguments one to three. Uh, we get the, the triplet with the first element, the function name. The second element uh, is a keyword containing metadata. In this case, it's empty. And the third is the argument list. We also use the unquote macro. Uh, when quote is about retrieving the inner representation of a particular chunk of code, unquote is used to inject some other particular chunk of code inside the representation we want to retrieve. So here uh, we see uh, that we are trying to, we inject the number into us with the 11 plus, and then we get the representation of it with the quote macro and then print it um, as a string. So back to the sideband contract, what we have to do to build a library for Elixir was 
uh, use Elixir macros to extend the language and add support for the design by contract constructs. Uh, we tag the existing functions with required and short tags that um, are, are our precondition and post conditions assertions. And m macros manipulate the code inside of manipulate a function body to insert precondition and post conditions inside our functions. So we can see a little example here of how to use our, uh, the library. Um, we had to redefine the def clause as support to the tax requires and ensures. Um, we can see here, uh, we also had to um, add support to the use clause. Um, you can see here in the short clause that number has to be a certain range and, and this is a little bit like pattern matching. And this is how contracts looked in the library, in the library that we have built. So demo time. What we are going, the example we're going to take here is something as simple as filling up and emptying a tank. So um, this is the, the model of the test for our contracts of filling up and <coughs> emptying a tank. Uh, we defined a tank with these parameters initially and used the library. For the function of filling up at the tank, uh, we inserted the precondition in the tag requires that the tank is not full at, at the beginning, that the in valve is opened and the tank and the out valve is closed. For the post condition, we have to ensure that um, the tank will be full at the end the, and the in valve will be closed also as the out valve. And we have the test for, dense, for that function. Uh, the tests are supposed to meet our preconditions. So in this case, this is a failing test, a failing test for filling the tank because it says that uh, it starts the tank with uh, level 10, which is already, uh, already full. And for the other, uh, other function, the empty in a tank function, we require that the in valve is closed and the out valve is open in the precondition and in the post condition under ensure clause, um, we make sure that it's empty and the in valve is closed and the out valve is also closed. Here we have the command of the empty function uh, leaving the tank at the end uh, in level one. But we all know that for the tank to be um, for the tank to be empty, it has to be in level zero. So the test, the test for this is going to break, but not because we are not using the test correctly, but because we are doing it badly on, on the function. So this is the test for the empty uh, tank function. And we are going to see it right now. <clears throat> so we can see here the both both of the tests and both of the functions, and we're going to try and run it to see what happens. So hopefully you all get to see this. Um, the, in the first test, the field function it says it fails and says that the precondition. Uh, we didn't meet the precondition and blame the client because the client's the one that is using it bad. There, sorry. Um, so, as I, as I was saying, in the first step, it failed because the client is using this wrong. And for the second test, um, okay, let's fix the first one. So we see that in this test we are leaving, we are starting with the tank with the level 10. It is already full, so it's not going to meet the precondition. And we're going to change it 
to level five so we can end up filling it. And with this, only the second test is failing. Um, as I said before, in the second test for it to empty the tank, the post condition is not met. So we have to blame ourselves because we're doing something wrong. Uh, what we have here is leaving the tank not empty with level one. We have to ensure that it is level zero for it to be empty. So with that, we have our two tests um, passing through. So you can find uh, this work in progress library uh, at the GitHub repo, Elixir contracts, and there's the URL. Um, this is still a work in progress library that we are working on uh, with my partner, Guillermo. And for this, we still need to do uh, some things, like we have to make it generous test cases from these contracts. Also, add configurations to turn on or off and the contracts during development as, and production. As I say, there were uh, advantages of this, of this methodology. Also, we need to generate uh, automated documentation from contracts and generate quick chest tests. So to conclude this talk, um, the side by contract does not replace regular testing strategy. Uh, rather, it complements external testing with internal self-tests uh, that can be activated both for isolated tests and in production code during a test. Um, the contracts add an extra grade of reliability, and they're not a silver, a silver bullet. We still need to do the testing, the contract, and some other uh, things to achieve what we would like to do and not end up with this mission really expensive crashes. Here are the references from the talk and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>